Okay, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the uh, first Institute of Physics talk at the University of Sussex of 2015. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, Darren Baskill, our outreach officer, who would have been normally the natural person to introduce our speaker, himself being an astronomer, um, is, uh, is down with the flu today. Um, so uh, uh, those of you who are hoping to see him, I'm, uh, I'm sure I'll convey your wishes for a speedy recovery. Uh, he'll be back soon. Um, so to, tonight we have uh, 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 a wonderful talk uh, in, uh, in store. Um, and to give it, here we have uh, uh, Karen Masters from the uh, University of Portsmouth. She uh, started her research career over the other side of the Atlantic, uh, her PhD in Cornell. She uh, did research uh, at Harvard uh, before coming to the University of Portsmouth. Um, she uh, is the uh, is project scientist in the Galaxy Zoo, um, which you may, may have heard of. And uh, if you want to know more about that, I'm sure she'll be happy to tell you afterwards. But uh, tonight she's going to tell you about uh, a project she's very heavily uh, involved in research-wise, uh, which is the uh, uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and, and, and more besides. So um, I'll let her explain uh, all about mapping the universe. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just to check that you can hear me. Yes, you can, can't you? The microphone is working great. Uh, so, um, so as, as Mark very kindly introduced, I'm an astronomer and I work at the University of Portsmouth. And a lot of people actually are sometimes a bit surprised to hear that there's uh, cosmology and, and research in cosmology going on at the University of Portsmouth. Um, we're something called the Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation at the University of Portsmouth. We've been around for about 10 years or so, a little bit more than 10 years, and I've been there for about six years. Um, and, and we genuinely are a uh, you know, world-leading cosmology and extragalactic astronomy group. Um, we don't have a, a full physics department, but that is growing in Portsmouth um, with the launch of an undergraduate physics degree a few years ago. And we're about to start physics with astrophysics and cosmology uh, this coming September. Um, but anyway, enough about Portsmouth, except that Portsmouth, of course, is much more well-known for the boat, the ships, the historic dockyard. Um, and so, um, scattered through my talk, you are going to see some of the sites of Portsmouth, um, and it's not totally random. I'm actually going to talk about um, um, how our maps of the universe, our view of the universe, has changed over time, as well as talking about the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And it turns out some of the boats in Portsmouth actually tie in quite nicely with these epochs. Um, so this is a drawing of the Mary Rose before it sank. Uh, this is HMS Victory. Um, this is HMS Warrior, which was an ironclad uh, steam slash sail, sail ship from 1860. Um, and this is to represent the modern Navy in Portsmouth, HMS Illustrious for any Navy aficionados. And, you know, the Navy uh, has contributed a lot to our maps of the Earth. Mapping the Earth, we go and you visit places and, and you make a map and you, um, you travel the world and you map the coastline and you, you know, I don't actually really know much about how uh, mapping the world is done, but I know people go and actually physically visit places to do it. Um, in astronomy, we can't do that. We can't easily go out into the universe um, and, and, and map in that way. All we can do is look out at the sky um, and try to understand what we're seeing. So this beautiful picture of the night sky taken by a wonderful astrophotographer called Stefan Vetter um, is sort of illustrating that, you know, this is what we have to work with when we're astronomers. So it's only natural, of course, that the, the, uh, the, the first view of what the universe was, was that it, the Earth was it, um, and that there was this fixed sphere of the heavens around it. And um, that's what people knew, that was their universe, um, you know, well before the time of the Mary Rose. Um, but astronomers, early astronomers, um, you know, one of the first things they notice is that not all stars behave in the same way. And so this idea of, of, of where the, the Earth is the whole universe and the fixed sphere of the heavens rotating over it, over them um, started to be called into question. Um, so this is a picture that has been, um, that's actually multiple pictures taken over several days, superimposed, showing the motion of a planet. This is actually the planet Mars um, across the background stars. Um, and so, you know, that's all, that's all well and good. You can have uh, fixed spheres going at different speeds, except for this uh, funny thing that the planets do. 
All of the uh, outer planets that we know are now outer planets do this. They have what's called retrograde motion. They appear to go backwards for a while and then go forwards again. Now, that's really hard to uh, explain in a model where um, the Earth's at the centre of the universe. Uh, people try to do it. They try to put all these crazy epicycles and things like that. But, um, but it was Copernicus coming along, um, whoops, backwards, basically at the time the Mary Rose was sailing around the oceans, um, that revolutionised the map of the universe. And instead of saying the Earth's at the centre of the universe, he put the Sun at the centre of the universe. This is the heliocentric map. Um, so this is uh, Copernicus's map of the universe with the sun at the centre and then the planets orbiting around it. We can then very easily explain this retrograde motion because um, the inner planets, so here's the Earth as an inner planet and Mars as an outer planet, the inner planets orbit the sun more quickly. Um, and so at certain times of the year, the Earth overtakes Mars. And as it does, you know, as you're sitting here on Earth looking at Mars, it appears to be in front of this star. Um, a few days later, it's in front of this star, so it's moved backwards. And a few days later, it's in front of this star. So it's moved even further backwards, and then as you go around, it starts to catch up, uh, basically, and, and progress forwards against the stars. Um, so now in the time, so now we know the solar system um, is, is made up of eight planets, uh, plus the dwarf planets, so Pluto being the namesake of dwarf planets, many, many, many other dwarf planets, it would appear, these days. Um, this is then put in order. It's very much not to scale, I should point out. The sun here is you know, a massive thing. The Earth would be well outside of this lecture theatre on this actual scale. I really like scale models of the solar system, and uh, this is one of my favourite pictures, actually, showing the planets properly to scale, just how vast Jupiter is compared to, um, compared to the tiny Earth. It's 100, 100 times bigger. But this, you know, Copernicus' universe, though, the solar system is it. The, the solar system is the whole universe, and you have this fixed sphere of, of the heavens, fixed sphere of stars outside it. And so it's a little cartoon version of it, and someone trying to break through the fixed sphere of the heavens. Um, actually, one of the big arguments, I think it's quite interesting, one of the big arguments against the heliocentric view of the universe um, was that if the Earth were going around the sun, you would expect to see nearby stars move with respect to further away stars. Um, and so the fact that we don't see this, we don't see this geometric effect, that's called, we call it parallax. Um, early astronomers, astronomers at the time of Copernicus said, we don't observe that. Therefore, you know, the stars would have to be inconceivably far away um, for, the, for the Earth to be going around the sun. Um, and so this uh, heliocentric universe must be wrong. Um, and this idea, this, this argument that things are inconceivably large, um, so we can't conceive of them being large, crops up again and again um, as we progress in our understanding of maps of the universe. Well, this is one of the first times it came up. Um, it turns out that the parallax does happen as the Earth orbits the Sun. Um, so if you observe a picture, uh, if you observe um, nearby stars, you do see them move back and forth as the Earth orbits around the Sun, just trigonometry, trigonometry in space. Um, the first person to measure this was a German astronomer named Frederick Bessel. So this is measured in 1838. Um, and so he basically made a position measurement of this star 61 Cygni, so it's in the uh, constellation of Cygnus, the swan. Um, you, you make a measurement of it in January against the other stars and a measurement of it in June against the other stars, and you, um, you see what the, the angle change is, um, and then you do trigonometry in space and you, you calculate the distance. And he did measure an implausibly, well, at the time, implausibly large difference, distance, 11 light years. So that's the distance that light travels in 11 years. So to put that into perspective, if you go back to our scale model of the solar system, we have the sun about this big and the Earth you know, way over outside of, the solar, outside of this lecture theatre. Um, light is taking eight minutes to go from the sun to the Earth. Um, and this is one of the nearby stars. It's taking 11 years to get there. In fact, the closest star to us, uh, light takes uh, three, uh, more, than, more than three years to get there. I think that's right. Is it a year? Or th anyway. It, the stars are very, very far away. Once you know how far away the stars are, you, you suddenly realise that to be as bright as they are, they must be incredibly, uh, incredibly luminous. Um, and in fact, so this is what the, go, the scale model of some different stars. So this is our sun. Here's Jupiter. You can see how much bigger than Jupiter our sun is. Um, and there are stars that are much, much bigger than our sun. There are stars that are smaller than it. This is a red dwarf star. Here's a blue giant star. And there are stars much bigger than these, you know, to sort of the scale of this lecture theatre again. Um, the size difference in stars is quite incredible. 
We're talking about mapping the universe, though. So once you've decided that stars aren't on a fixed sphere going around a solar system, your universe suddenly becomes a lot bigger. And you suddenly now have to start thinking about what, 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 you know, where are the stars? What's the map of the locations of the stars? How are the stars arranged um, in our universe? So again, you go back to the night sky and you start thinking about this if you're an astronomer and you think, well, well what's this telling me about how the stars are arranged? Um, by now, you've got a telescope, and so you can actually have a look at this milky band that's going across the sky, and you realise it's not a cloud. I mean, it's always there. It's, uh, if it's dark enough, it's always there. It's not a set of clouds. Actually, if you look with a telescope, it's resolved into individual stars. And so this is telling you, this goes all the way around the, the sky. Um, if you go to the southern hemisphere, it's much more impressive than it is here in the north. Um, it's telling you that we live in a sort of flat structure of stars in some way. There's many, many more stars in this direction than there are above it and below it. So the first people to make this leap, or well, the first person really to make this leap, was, was uh, William Herschel, aided um, in the observations of the night sky by his sister Caroline Herschel. And this is the very first map of our galaxy, a galaxy just a collection of stars. Um, and here we have HMS Victory. Um, these guys were doing the work around the time of the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, so this, this is a really important map of the universe. At this point, this is the whole universe, right? This collection of stars that's the galaxy. Um, it's the first time it's, it's uh, shown as, as a sort of coherent three-dimensional structure. It's a flat structure. Um, but basically everything about this map of the galaxy is completely wrong. Um, um, so there's, there's a bunch of reasons why they got it wrong um, to do with you know, figuring out what the distances were to all these stars. Um, they put the sun here in the centre of the galaxy, which we, we don't believe is the case. Um, this is not the structure that we think the galaxy has. Um, and they, also the estimate of the size was, was off by uh, sort of an order of magnitude. So it's it very, very, very different to our current model. Um, at the time of HMS Warrior, about the age of sort of 1900, 19, a little bit later, um, this is the sort of state-of-the-art map of the galaxy. Now we're starting to see spiral structure in the galaxy. But again, um, it was an astronomer named Cornelius Easton made this map. He still put, wanted to put the sun in the center of the galaxy, although you get this sort of impression that really he knew the center was over here. But he still put the sun in the center of the map, at least. So he's starting to, astronomers by the 1900s were starting to realize that the galaxy we live in had spiral arms and, and was not quite the same structure as Herschel said. Um, and the size of it was also um, getting a bit better, getting a bit bigger, but still under debate. Um, this is a modern artist's impression of the galaxy that we live in. Um, so, uh, as Mark mentioned in the introduction, a lot of my research is about the structures that are seen in galaxies, which I'm really not going to talk about much in this talk. Um, but this is a classic spiral galaxy. It's sort of a CD shape. It's got a bold... Um, Patrick Moore's favourite analogy was two fried eggs stuck back to back for the shape, the three-dimensional stru uh, structure of, of galaxies. Um, and this is the galaxy that we live in. Astronomers, um, part of the reason that this spiral structure was figured out quite early on, you know, Cornelius Easton figured it out in 1900, is that if you look out at the night sky and you, you look with improved telescopes, you see a lot of spiral nebula all over the sky. Um, so this is a picture of, of a patch of sky um, in the Virgo constellation. This is the Virgo cluster showing lots and lots and lots of different galaxies all over the sky. Spiral nebulae, they were called um, initially. This is the first ever picture um, of a spiral galaxy or a spiral nebulae. Um, this was actually drawn by hand by an astronomer um, at the, what at the time was the biggest telescope in the world. Um, he was a rich earl in Ireland. He built the biggest telescope in the world in his back garden and made observations of galaxies. This is around the 1830s. Um, he did an amazing job. That's the Hubble Space Telescope picture of the same galaxy. But this was huge debate went on and on and on for actually more than 100 years about what these galaxies were. Are these gas clouds within our own galaxy? What these spiral nebulae are, I say. Keep giving it away. Um, are these gas clouds in our own galaxy or are they galaxies in their own right? Um, and there was a famous debate um, in 1920 between these two astronomers. This is Harlow Shapley and uh, Heber Curtis, two American astronomers. And it was a, a big public event. People were invited. It took more than an hour. So I've taken the liberty of summarizing their arguments a bit. Um, so basically, Heber Curtis had a certain size estimate for the galaxy based on a certain measured, uh, me method of measuring distances. And he said, you know, the galaxy is this size, and spiral nebulae are obviously other galaxies outside of it. Uh, Here's Harlow Shapley demonstrating the same thing that early astronomers at the time of Copernicus did. He's saying, you're wrong. The Milky Way is much bigger than you think. He had a different distance method, so he estimated it to be much bigger. So it's ridiculous that the spiral nebulae could be outside of it. The universe can't possibly be that big. Um, 
So there's the clue. Um, so Harlow Shapley was right about the size of the Milky Way, approximately. He was much writer, at least, than Heber Curtis. Um, but obviously, Heber Curtis was right that the galaxies were external, the spiral nebulae were external to our own galaxy. Um, so the universe was much bigger than could be conceived of at the time. This all could only be sort of resolved if you could figure out the distances to galaxies. Um, so I sort of explained um, this method of parallax for measuring distances to nearby stars, um, and you know, measuring the size of the Milky Way was sort of a, a, an ongoing problem in astronomy. Measuring the distances to galaxies is even harder. And so we sort of have two broad methods, and I'm going to talk through a few of the uh, examples of these methods being put into action. Basically, if you can work out something in a galaxy that has a known brightness, you can use how bright it appears to measure the distance to it. This is the inverse square law. This is the fact that a candle, um, as it moves further away, will, get, um, will appear to be dimmer um, as uh, one over the distance squared. So it gets dimmer quite quickly. Um, that's why in the outer solar system, um, you can't use solar, pan uh, solar panels for spacecraft because the light from the sun is so incredibly dim out there. Or, if you can figure out the length of something, um, the physical length of something in a galaxy, you can then just use trigonometry to work out its distance. Um, so here we've got a ruler, and as it moves further away, it appears to get smaller. So this is called the standard candle method, and this is called the standard ruler method for measuring distances to galaxies. And so now the trick is going to be identifying something with a known brightness or something with a known size. <coughs> This astronomer uh, is named Henrietta Leavitt, and she worked out um, something with a known brightness in galaxies um, in, in her work in astronomy. Um, this is now called the Leavitt Law. Um, there's a type of star called a Cepheid variable, um, which varies in brightness. And Henrietta Leavitt worked out that the, um, the Cepheid variables that varied more quickly were fainter, and the ones that varied more slowly were brighter. By calibrating that relationship between how quickly the stars varied in brightness um, and how bright they actually were, she then provided a way to measure the distances to gal any galaxy where you could identify Cepheid variables. And this is a technique which is used over and over again in astronomy and still being calibrated, and the calibration is still being improved. Um, another thing that uh, can be used in galaxies is the brightness of a certain type of supernova. This is uh, a special type of supernova called a Type 1a. So most supernova are a single star exploding when it runs out of nuclear uh, fuel. A type 1a supernova, we think, um, is actually a binary star system where one star has already turned into a white dwarf, which is a very sort of um, uniform type of object, and it's accreting material from the other star. When the right dwarf, when the what, right, I can't say white dwarf, <laughs> well, I'm giving a talk apparently, um, when the white dwarf um, hits 1.4 solar masses, um, it's something called the Chandrasekhar limit for any undergrad studying uh, stellar structure, um, it's going to explode in a type 1a supernovae. Um, and because it's always the same mass, this 1.4 solar masses, um, that's why we think they're so uniform. Now, we're scientists, so we don't just think they're so uniform, we actually make measurements, and it turns out they're not exactly uniform. Um, so. Uh, type 1a supernovae that take a little bit longer to dim. So this is a light curve. This is how bright the supernovae are on the sky um, as a function of days after they uh, exploded. So they get brighter and then they get dimmer. The ones that take a little bit longer to dim um, appear to be a little bit brighter. Um, this can be calibrated and, and fixed out and it becomes a standardizable candle. So you just have to wait for a supernova to go off in a galaxy and you can measure its distance. It has to be this kind of supernovae, which we think on average happens about every 300 years in every galaxy. So 300 years or so, if we were to monitor every single galaxy, we could have a distance by this method. Um, but this method can be cross-calibrated with the Cepheid method, and, and this is sort of the game that we play in estimating distances to galaxies. I wanted to give you one example of a standard ruler technique, and I think this galaxy here is the best example that we have. Um, this should be a really famous galaxy uh, in astronomy. This is uh, Messier 106, or NGC 4258, not very excitingly named. Um, but excitingly, it has a, a supermassive black hole in its center, like all galaxies do. Um, and the exciting thing about this, though, is that it's got an accretion disk going around it, and there are masers in the accretion disk. This is the microwave version of a laser, very, very bright um, in radio emission. And we can use this um, to basically measure how material is rotating around the black hole. Okay, so you say, so how does that help us figure out the distance? 
So we need a bit of physics here. Uh, astronomers, modern astrophysicists, astronomers use physics all the time in our work. Um, and so it's really a, a great application of physics. Um, so the one that, that I, need you to, I need you to know, basically, this is, the, this is the one that I need you to know about, the Doppler effect. And you are familiar with this. Um, I assume most of you have walked down the street and had an ambulance uh, pass you as you walk. And so you've heard the sound of the ambulance change pitch as it goes past you. So as it comes towards, to, towards you, the pitch is higher. And then as it passes you, the pitch drops. It goes, nino, 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 as it passes you. Um, so this is the, the cartoon version of that. So you get a lower frequency uh, sound um, when the thing that's emitting the sound is moving away from you and a higher frequency um, when it's moving towards you. Now, this Doppler effect works for all waves, and light is a wave. So this works for light um, just like it works for sound. So it works for the light from galaxies, or it works from the light um, from a maser orbiting around a supermassive black hole in the centre of a galaxy. Um, and if the, the thing that's emitting the light is, move, is, is at rest with respect to you, you get one measurement of the light. Um, if it's moving away from you, you get a measurement that is a bit redder. The wavelength has been stretched. And when you stretch the wavelength of light, you make it slightly redder. Um, and if it's moving towards you, it gets bluer. And if you, um, if you compress the wavelength of light, um, the, wave, the wavelength gets shorter, that's bluer light. These shifts are, are very, very tiny. So we can only measure them in things where we know very precisely what the color should be or what the wavelength should be. Um, luckily for us, physics again obliges. So atoms have these uh, very distinctive places where they either emit or absorb light. Um, we call them emission lines or absorption lines. If we can split the light um, from something in astronomy very, very accurately, we can measure very, very precisely um, the speed at which the object that's emitting is moving away from us or moving towards us. We use it in galaxies all the time, so this will come up again in a minute uh, for galaxies. But right now, um, the point is that we can measure the speed at which masers on this side of the accretion disk are moving this way. Uh, no, they must be going this way because it's blue. Look, it's been color-coded blue. So this side's moving towards us, and this side's moving away from us. And we can measure very, very pre precisely how fast things are orbiting. Um, the reason that helps um, is that there's this thing called Kepler's law. So physics, again, this is just gravity. Um, so just depending on how massive the supermassive black hole is, um, the speed at which things are moving around it um, tells you the size of it, it tells you the distance. So basically by measuring the speed of the stuff in this accretion disk, we measure the physical size of the accretion disk, and we get a big gigantic triangle in space, and we get the distance to this galaxy incredibly accurately. Now unfortunately, this kind of maser accretion disk where you can do this technique is quite rare. Um, there's now about 15, 20 galaxies where this has done, been done. Um, but luckily, this galaxy actually had Cepheid variable stars in it as well. So it was able to calibrate the Cepheid variable star distance scale independent of other means. And we spend all, you know, a lot of time sort of calibrating these different methods all together. So I want to just sort of talk through a few of these methods to give you a flavor that there's a lot of different ways to measure the distances to galaxies these days. Um, and the most famous, the first sort of application of measuring the distances to galaxies was actually using the Cepheid variable method. Um, so this astronomer, Edwin Hubble, um, published this plot. Um, what he did was take uh, measurements of, of the speed at which galaxies were moving from the Doppler effect that were done by this guy, uh, Slipher, Dr. Slipher, forgotten his first name, I'm afraid. And then he took measurements of the distances to galaxies using the Cepheid variable technique that uh, Henrietta Leavitt had constructed. And he plotted them against each other. And he found this extraordinary thing. Um, this is not the most convincing plot, but it's been held up uh, time and time again uh, in future plots. And this is the first time it was demonstrated. Um, the further away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us. So velocity on this way and distance this way. Um, it's not completely one-to-one -one for a bunch of different reasons. Also, measurement error in here. Um, but this was revolutionary, actually, for measuring the distances to galaxies. Um, because measuring the velocity of them using these redshifts um, turned out to not, is not that uh, expensive observationally. You need a, a spectroscope on a telescope, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's a relatively straightforward measurement to make. Whereas measuring the distances, well, if you've got Cepheid variables, you need to sit and watch them vary. You've got to calibrate things. Or you've got to be lucky. You've got a maser accretion disk in your galaxy, or you've got to be lucky that a supernova goes off. Measuring distances remains tricky. There's still only a few thousand galaxies with distances uh, measured in these sort of redshift independent ways, we call them, whereas we now have millions of galaxies with redshift measurements. And this relation means that we can just basically say that the redshift, um, the velocity at which the galaxies are moving away from us, um, tells us their distance. 
So a little bit of a primer of astronomers' units of distance, um, because I will accidentally um, just jump between these different things as units of distance. And um, we already talked about light years, right? The, the time, um, the distance that light travels in a year. Often confusing because it appears to be a time, but it's actually the distance that light travels in a year. Um, parsecs. I really apologise for that. Um, it's sort of an obscure astronomical reason that we use parsecs or millions of parsecs or billions of parsecs. Um, basically, you just need a, a factor of three. So one parsec is about three light years. One million parsecs is about three million light years. That's all really you need to know about that. And then because of this Hubble's law, we also accidentally sometimes will quote distances in speed, kilometers per second. Um, so again, sorry about that. But that's just because of Hubble's law, because there is this one-to-one -one relationship. That's all very well to have a one-to-one -one relationship, but you need to know what the constant of proportionality is to be able to actually use it to measure distances. Um, so this was my old boss in Harvard, John Hooker, who's a fairly famous astronomer. And he used to have on his door this plot um, showing measurements of the Hubble constant, so the constant of proportionality of that line that Hubble uh, found, um, since um, the value that Hubble put in his plot, which was this one, um, to the modern day. Um, and so you can see it's been quite a history of, of of trying to work out and calibrate this relationship between redshift and distances for galaxies, um, but we're starting to get a bit better. Um, there was some interesting weird psychology going on from 1970 to sort of the modern day where you had one group who thought it was about 100 and kept making measurements up there and one group who thought it was about 50 and made measurements down here and now we all sort of agree it's about 70 um, in these really peculiar units. So um, this is kilometres per second per megaparsec. So again, sorry about that, but that's what we do. But anyway, once you've calibrated this relationship, we can use redshift to get distances, and you can map galaxy, you can map the, ga the universe of galaxies much more straightforwardly. So John Hooker again and his collaborator Margaret Galler um, made basically the first large-scale map of the universe, map of where galaxies were um, in the 1980s. Um, this was a thousand galaxies, roughly, um, done in 1986. It's called the CFA Redshift Survey. Um, and they mapped in just a small patch of the sky. It was a big strip of sky that went through um, the coma cluster in the Northern Hemisphere, a little movie which shows um, what, what then happens. So you've got your strip of sky, and because they've measured the distances, you can then rotate it and get a three-dimensional map of, of the universe. And so that's what's going on in this little movie. And if we just skip forward, this was the map that they came out with. So this is now, we're here down at this point, um, and this is now distance away from us, and this is that strip across the sky, and there's now the three-dimensional structure that was seen in there. Um, this was quite a famous uh, map of the universe. Um, it basically demonstrated for the first time that galaxies weren't just randomly distributed through the whole universe. Um, they appeared to be um, coming up in structure. And the media really liked it because it was a little man, a little stick man. So it got a lot of press. It probably shouldn't have been a surprise oops, that galaxies clustered. It had been actually known for a long time that um, the galaxies on the sky, just on the sky, even if you didn't know the distance, um, clumped together. So this is from 1922. So before, really, it had been settled that these things were galaxies in their own right, so were external to our own galaxy, talking about how that they're sort of clumping together. He also comments on this big gap. Now, this is a map of the whole sky, right? So you're familiar with this maps of the Earth, where we take the whole globe and fold it out and put it on a piece of paper. This is now the whole sky folded out into a piece of paper. And it's plotted so that our galaxy lies in a big line across here. So we can't see external galaxies behind our own galaxy. So that should have been a big clue that they're actually outside of our own galaxy in itself, right? Um, so we can really only see them above it and below it. Um, but you see they sort of clump together. And um, we have different names for different sort of sizes of clumps of galaxies. So a group of galaxies, a few tens of galaxies, a beautiful picture here of a group of four or five galaxies, all at roughly the same distance. <coughs> and then clusters are hundreds to thousands of galaxies, and there are a lot of clusters in the universe. And these are incredibly um, deep potential wells, so incredibly massive collections of galaxies. Um, you can see this beautiful, beautiful picture. Um, and then groups and clusters themselves cluster into these things we call superclusters. So this was a quote from John Hooker, again, my old boss. So many galaxies, so little time. He was mapping the distances to galaxies by measuring spectra one at a time. And this is where the Sloan Digital Sky Survey came in. So this is um, around uh, 2000. Um, you could now, um, you know, in your phone, you, you guys now have a CCD camera, right? You have a digital camera in your phone. It was astronomers who first um, started to de develop them for large-scale large use. They were um, 
developed for other uses before that, but astronomers certainly um, really took them to heart and started using them on telescopes incredibly quickly. And the Sloan Digital Sky Survey decided to build a, basically a gigantic digital camera and map as much of the sky as, as was plausible from this relatively modest telescope, which is in uh, uh, New Mexico in, in the States. Um, so it mapped actually about 25% of the sky, um, uh, imaging of the sky, and then used that to identify where all the galaxies were. And then it made these um, things called uh, plug plates. Basically, um, this is basically a big sheet of aluminium with a thousand holes drilled in it. And, into, and each one of those holes is drilled very carefully to, when it's put on the back of the telescope on a spectroscope, line up very precisely with the location of a galaxy. You plug an optical fiber into this plate, so that's what all these are, a thousand optical fibers plugged into a plate, and you stick this whole thing at the back of the telescope, and you measure a thousand redshifts in one go. And you can do eight to ten of these in a night, so you can measure 8,000, 10,000 distances to galaxies in a single night of telescope time. So you can see immediately, now we're going to be able to make much, much bigger maps of the, of the universe. This is a zoom out of the imaging starting from the Whirlpool galaxy that the Sloan Digital Sky Survey did. So now this is sort of like an inverse globe of the sphere, of the sky. So it didn't map the whole sky, but it's mapped big chunks of it. This is actually where our galaxy is, where this big gap is. So we want to map the locations of galaxies. The beautiful imaging, and the images that we show in Galaxy Zoo are from this survey, or the first ones were. So we had images of a million uh, nearby galaxies. And this was the map that was made using the distances to those million galaxies. And this is where the modern navy has decided to, to enter. Um, so this is showing this large-scale structure, these bubbles and sort of froth of the cosmic web in a, in a very large chunk of the universe now. Um, but Sloan, as I mentioned, didn't map the entire sky. So this is, again, um, one of these folded-out maps of the whole sky, and the white now is where Sloan has mapped. So our own galaxy on this projection, I think, goes this way. Um, so this is the celestial equator. So this is, the, whoops, this is the part of the sky you can see from the northern hemisphere. So Sloan has a telescope in the northern hemisphere, so it's easier to see there. Um, but we've got this gap down here. You know, here be dragons. Um, obviously, it's not going to be dragons. Physics tells us it should all be the same everywhere. Um, but some physicists like to test this. And um, one such physicist um, was, again, my old boss, John Hooker. He wanted to make a, a complete map of the nearby universe, the whole sky. Um, and this is actually what I worked with him on when I was uh, a researcher in Harvard. Um, was called the Two-Mass Redshift Survey. And it was, the idea was to make a map of galaxies over as much of the sky as we could manage to a sort of uniform depth. So we didn't have as many galaxies as Sloan. We have 42,000 galaxies instead of a million. But again, most of them painstakingly done one by one, and an awful lot of that observing done by John Hooker himself. Um, but this is now a map of the local universe from this two-mass redshift survey, and now the galaxies are color-coded by distance. Um, so the nearest ones are purple, and the most distant ones are red. I've got another version of it which has been um, somewhat labeled. So again, this is the same thing. The whole sky folded out into an atlas. And this beautiful uh, picture of the Milky Way has been stuck in the gap um, where we can't see other galaxies. But you can see all this sort of bubbles and froth again of local universe, and we're starting to give things names. So here's the Coma Cluster from the original CFA Redshift Survey. Um, Harlow Shapley has a supercluster named after him, which I think is probably well-deserved. Um, M31 is down here, the Andromeda Galaxy, our nearest large galaxy, and other superclusters. Um, so what we know now about you know, the map of our own universe um, is that the Milky Way is actually in quite a, a relatively small group of galaxies. We call it a local group. Um, so the Milky Way, here's this artist impression of the Milky Way, um, is surrounded by um, a host of smaller galaxies, much, much smaller though, you know, sort of orders of magnitude smaller than the Milky Way. So we call them satellite galaxies. The two big, biggest are called the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds, but there's a bunch of other ones. Um, and then the Andromeda galaxy is our nearest large neighbor. It's actually probably, probably larger than the Milky Way and about two million light years away. Um, and it also has a host of satellite galaxies. And these pair of galaxies are actually moving towards each other. So probably in about four billion years, they might actually merge and collide. <clears throat> and the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy, the local group is sort of towards the edge of what we call the Virgo supercluster or the local supercluster. Um, and this is sort of a attempt at plotting some of these nearby superclusters, but you know, basically we're starting to see the starts of this cosmic web that we're sort of part of um, in our map of the universe. 
And on the very largest scales, we think the universe is very homogeneous. Um, it has this sort of frothy, bubble, cosmic wave type structure going through all of it. But, you know, if you look in any one direction, on, on average, you should see sort of the same stuff. That's why surveys like the Solar Digital Sky Survey aren't worrying too much about mapping the whole sky, because we actually think it really should be the same pretty much everywhere. Um, what Sloan wants to do next, and has, is now starting to do, is actually map deeper into the universe. Um, so this is one of those pie charts again, so we're down here, this is distance from us um, in a sort of a chunk of the sky. Um, and then these white ones, these white dots are supposed to be the, the galaxies from the original Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, this is supposed to be the edge of the observable universe, the so-called cosmic microwave background radiation, so the first light that, that free streamed across the universe after the Big Bang happened. And Sloan wants to map the distribution of galaxies in this gap, but it hasn't been done yet. Now, why would you want to do that? Why do you care? Well, it turns out that that large-scale structure actually has imprints in it of the physical conditions under which uh, structure formed in, in the universe. Um, and one of the things that happened was that in the early universe, there were acoustic bubbles happening in the plasma. Um, and so there's actually a uh, preferential distance scale on which galaxies will be clustered. Um, it's called the baryon acoustic oscillation scale. It's about 100 uh, megaparsecs, 100 300 million light years, galaxies are slightly more likely to be at that distance from another galaxy than any other distance. Um, and that gives you a standard ruler at very large distances anywhere in the universe. If you can measure that scale, we know it should be 100 uh, million parsecs or 300 million light years. And so we can actually measure distances to very large distances and we can uh, learn about um, the evolution of the expansion of the universe and also learn about how structure formed um, overall. And then going to the, you know, the very outer edges of the universe now. So this is really um, as far as we can ever hope to see. Um, this is a beautiful map uh, from the Planck satellite of the cosmic microwave background. So again, the very first light that was shown in the universe. Now, this is incredibly uniform light, actually. We're bathed in this glow um, of microwave radiation that's incredibly uniform all over the sky. It's more uniform than the flattest surface you can imagine, more uniform than Teflon. Um, so it only varies in one part in 10,000. Uh, 10, um, but that's been exaggerated in this picture to reveal these bumps and wiggles. And it's measurements of the bumps and wiggles um, that can uh, give you an estimate of the distance to this. Um, so again, it's a standard ruler technique. We know what size um, the preferential bump should be. And so we get a gigantic uh, triangle in space to measure the distance to this, which really pins down our cosmological models. Um, but also, these are the seeds of stru uh, structure formation. These are the things which will evolve and grow into superclusters um, as gravity pulls the material together over time. <coughs> um, so that's actually uh, my entire talk. It's a little bit shorter than I had intended, but that's OK. Um, and just wanted to end um, where I started with this beautiful movie, which is a visualization, a fly-through of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey map. Um, and actually, it's, it's going to do something that's not allowed. It's actually going to fly outside of the visible universe and um, get to the edge. Um, so you can see the froths. You can see the cosmic web. Um, you can also see the funny structure. So there's gaps, right, where we've not done any observations. Um, so you, some of these lines and things are just the gaps where we haven't surveyed with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey here. And this is where our galaxy is. So this is the bit where it's actually really hard to see behind anyway. Um, these are now uh, distances to quasars, so much more uniform. We're not really seeing large-scale structure anymore. And now we're flying outside of the cosmic microwave background to see the whole visible universe in one go. So thanks. Thanks for a great talk, and, and uh, the fantastic thing is that there's lots of time for questions. Yeah. Uh, question here. What physical process would cause a psychic variable star to vary? So, um, <clears throat> certain kinds of stars are quite unstable. So basically, it's light, light pressure pushing it. It's, it's actually physically sort of pulsating in size. So the light pressure is pushing stuff out, and then gravity pulls it back in. So I think it is, yeah, it's a type of star that is not too far from you know, exciting things. Like I think they're low mass enough that they're going to turn into planetary nebulae. 
Is it ionised helium? Yeah. In what way is it ionised helium? Well, if you've got uh, an ion of helium, it's only got one electron left. <coughs> so it can absorb electromagnetic energy coming from the centre of the star. Once it's absorbed enough for the electron to disappear, it's doubly ionised, and it's transparent. So the radiation can come out. It's like fog clearing in the morning. Oh, OK. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, what were these acoustic ripples that you showed? So they're literally that. They're pressure waves in the, in the plasma and at the time of the CMB. The picture you showed was, that was just some That's very artist. exaggerated. Yeah, some artist's impression. I should, have, I should have said that very clearly. You can't see it in the map of the, of the, of the galaxies, but if you do very careful statistics, um, so you measure, basically you do um, count the distances between every two pairs of galaxies in your map and then compare that to a random map, you'll see that there are certain scales that are preferred and you'll see a big bump at 100 megaparsecs, if you've done it right. Yeah. Where are your studies, which are the things that, or which are one or two of the things that have really stood out to you to sort of blow your mind off, sort of, which, or, do you show a lot of uh, particular interest when you're teaching um, that course when you're teaching at the university? Are there two, sort of two or three specific things which you're really enthusiastic about? So I'm enthusiastic about a lot of a things. Lot. Um, <laughs> Research-wise, I really find galaxies interesting. I want to try to understand why there are different kinds of galaxies in the universe and how they fit into our model of the universe. So my actual acad in my academic research is all on galaxy populations. Um, I sort of came at it through working on redshift surveys, and I got very interested in a certain method of measuring the distances to galaxies, um, which basically is using how fast a spiral galaxy is rotating um, to give you a... Um, a standard candle, basically, so a more, a more massive galaxy that has more stars that's brighter will rotate faster because it has more material and it can, it can hold itself together as it rotates faster. Um, this is called the Tully-Fisher relation, and so my, my, uh, a lot of my academic work was on the Tully-Fisher relation, and then I got interested in how galaxies worked. Um, but I started in it as a, as a method of measuring distances to galaxies. Um, in terms of teaching and, and talking to people about astronomy, um, one of the, my favourite things is talking about the scale of the universe, and I think that really blows your mind. If you can really um, conceive of the scale of the universe, um, well, you, you can't help but be massively impressed. Um, how does it work? Sorry. Um, how does it work in terms of uh, university working with other universities around the world, or people being able to sort of um, being able to work with our sourcing projects or, or you know, working on large scale mm. for the connection through the internet is going to be through people yeah. that can be connected fairly. fairly so the at the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is a great example of how modern collaborations work in science. So it's a collaboration of more than 200 scientists on, at more than 20 institutions. Um, and actually on every continent, maybe not every continent. I don't think we have any African uh, universities involved. But we have China, um, the US, South America, and Europe. Uh, and basically, you know, it, it, you put together an agreement and all of the universities are contributing to the running cost of the survey and then everyone who works at all those universities has access to the data. So Portsmouth has been involved in Sloan um, for a very long time uh, now. Possibly. So, uh, so in Portsmouth we have 50 researchers and so some of my colleagues might be. Um, I'm not personally familiar with that. No. So, So it's in the centre of our galaxy, and the centre of our galaxy is in the, um, the, dis uh, the direction of the Sagittarius constellation, um, the one that looks like a teapot, if you've ever you do night sky observing. Um, and it's quite low in the sky here, but if you go to telescopes in the southern hemisphere, it's very high in the sky, and there's been some beautiful, beautiful measurements of stars very near um, the centre of our galaxy and the speeds at which they're moving. And you can actually see them orbiting the black hole. And um, the the amount of mass that must be in such a tiny space, there's really no explanation for that other than a black hole in the centre of our own galaxy. 
it's not, it doesn't have an accretion disk, it's not um, um, actively gobbling up material, so it's not, sh it's not creating lots of x-rays and, and being very dangerous um, as the one that was in that galaxy. I showed you was uh, any life in that galaxy is probably been wiped out by the x-rays from uh, the material that's getting incredibly hot and falling into, onto its black hole. Um, 